Okay. I'm recording. Hi, Nick. Jay Bregman. I'm uh, admiring the scenery behind you. Please tell me that's not virtual. Unfortunately, it is. Um, it is. But uh, I'm here in uh, downtown New York City in, in Soho. So. Yes. Well, that looks like Montana or somewhere wonderful. Um, I'm in I'm in 90 degree Florida, so I uh, that actually looks quite inviting, especially with your sweater on. I mean, yeah, gotta, well, you know, they we're expecting snow this weekend, uh, even in in New York. So, uh, kind yeah. of blessed. it's like um, as I was describing to someone yesterday on Twitter, Northeast weather is like uh, the spring comes. It's cold, cold, less cold. Quickly put the air conditioners in. Mm-hmm. I you think know. that about right kind of like that so uh jay i start all of these by giving allowing the guests to have a little bit of an uh elevator pitch a platform uh so why don't you introduce yourself and your company and describe uh what it is that you do sure uh so uh jay bregman uh, founder and ceo of thimble um so uh, we make uh, insurance simple so small businesses can succeed on their own terms Uh, And what that means is we have a very flexible on-demand policy, small business policy that allows you to buy anywhere between an hour and a year of insurance. We allow you to pause that insurance, uh, to buy it month to month if you want. Uh, And so it's just a much more flexible, differentiated, evolved product than the one-size-fits-all annual policies currently sold by everybody else. Yeah. So have to ask you, um, in these pandemic times, what's it like? How's, what's, what's, your, what's your portfolio and your, your business model looking like? What's so interesting to us is we have always had the most flexible uh, policies available. Uh, you know, so half our policies uh, are sold for, for less than a day. But 40% of our policies are now a, our month-to-month product, which basically allows you to get a continuous coverage, uh, but you pay for it only one month at a time. So you buy one month policy, then if you like it, you get a two month policy, three month policy, etc. Uh, that has grown astronomically. Um, so we're now in 48 states with that product. Uh, and it, it is selling phenomenally because small businesses or you know, and even slightly larger businesses have never faced greater uncertainty about what happens next month. And yep. so even, com- even uh, you know, uh, uh, companies that might have had a traditional annual policy are now finding that all of the payroll information they gave is no longer valid, that they don't even know if they're going to be in business next month. And so they, they would rather pay for a month-to-month solution, a flexible solution, uh, than they would uh, an annual policy. And so we're seeing all kinds of new customers uh, come into our universe, which uh, you know, I think is really great. And I think that will persist, that anxiety about either starting a business, many of our customers are just starting a business for the first time, or managing a business through uncertain times is likely to really persist, and I think that's great for our model. Yeah, so when you were, uh, when you were designing the company, beginning the process to um, you know, put the necessary pieces in place, can't imagine that you thought that this sort of phenomenon would, would happen, but perhaps this, uh, this type of event has sort of, did it, did it sort of um, justify, did it uh, confirm a lot of the theses that you had uh, around your potential business model? So I think when we thought about the business, we were thinking mainly about people that were just getting started in business, right? There's so many different types of people who are trying to establish their brand of success in business. That could be because they're learning to be a photographer or a hairdresser or a personal trainer. Some of them might be only doing it one or two days a week while they grow up. And so there's always this uncertainty when you're starting a business about, uh, you know, what is life going to look like next month or the month after? What are your payroll going to look like or uh, your, your revenues? And basically, we're a solution to that uncertainty. Um, what we have found is just as the level of uncertainty has gone up, that has now uh kind of transmitted itself to even bigger businesses such that every small business really now is, and even bigger businesses are facing unforeseen uncertainty about what's going to happen next month in terms of payroll. That's actually made them very similar in buying habits to the embryonic 
small businesses. So uh, what, what I think this has done by introducing this new uncertainty is, is it's leveled the playing field between big and small and allowed our products to have value across the spectrum. Uh, and I think that's, you know, it's just very, very important uh, because again, uh, you know, success is really relative to what's going on in, in the environment. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, committing to an insurance policy ahead of your revenues or your exposure bases, um, you know, is just something that many businesses don't want to do. Yeah. So uh, do you, do you f think that um, with your particular model, as we, you know, potentially roll over to a new normal, that um, this could be the standard style of how insurance is bought and sold. Like your, uh, your customer base could get very comfortable or uh, do you have a little bit of nervousness that they'll go back to the old normal and want a year policy? No, I mean, look, we, we, we sell your policy. So it's, it's not a big Doesn't matter, uh, uh, not, not a big issue for, for us. We want to have the, the biggest spectrum and the most flexibility. I mean, for, for example, we just introduced a pause feature. So basically, not only can you buy your policy on a month to month basis, but if you want, you can actually go into our app and you can pause the policy for up to 30 days, suspend the coverage, suspend all payments, et cetera. You know, to me, this is a much better solution than a lot of the other small business uh, insurers out there that have just, you know, oh, your, your April payroll is 25 percent less. Yeah, that's great. But what about May? Right. Like, so, so, so to us, basically, this allows you a temporary reprieve of both your coverage. Uh, and your payments, uh, which is, I think, important. And look, I think that the reverberations of uh, what is going on in the market with COVID will persist for a very long time. I mean, yeah. we, we look at uh, the, the growth, the, the dominance of companies like USAA, Progressive, and Geico. They all were founded around major cataclysmic events, be that the Great Depression in the case of USAA or World War II in the case of uh, Geico and Progressive, we don't think that's an accident. We think that basically that is a fundamental, those sort of cataclysmic events like COVID fundamentally reset people's barometer for risk and, and therefore have them looking for different kind of companies and different kind of solutions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually think that's, um, that's what's going to happen in the life insurance space as well. I think there's been, always been like some hand wringing about young professionals not buying life insurance. I think this is the this is the event that changes their mindset on well can't go into another pandemic or something else I should take care of that now so I I I almost think it is a we will not go back to normal it will go back to a new normal things I think things will have to change in 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 all of our spheres uh, regardless of uh, it does not even just insurance just but I think I think insurance as well is. Uh, as much as we're, uh, I feel like we're withstanding this, um, I don't see how we don't come out different. I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, you know, I think it, it's kind of a, just a cognitive reset in terms of the way people perceive risk. You know, what is the worst that can happen? Now, over time, that may fade, right? Uh, but, but I think for the next couple of years uh, and maybe decades, uh, people will be talking about this event, you know, when the streets went silent in New York City. Yeah. Uh, nobody thought it could happen, but it did. And therefore, when they think about protecting themselves against risks that might not be as apparent to them today, I think they will have this muscle memory. Um, what the economics of your particular model, um, given that people can turn it on and off or people can buy it in short uh, swaths, right? Is it possible that... Um, the economics work out in such a way that they're buying it in anticipation of risk. Like I'm going, um, I'll, uh, you know, I, I have this job coming up. I have the potential for more risk coming on. So I'm going to buy the insurance now. Uh, do you, d does it play out that way? Or do you, do you find that the insurance is being purchased just like any other insurance, the way that gets purchased it's just a, uh, you know, they have different revenue streams, so they have to purchase it in a different way. Yeah, I mean, look, m most people are buying, uh, and most meaning 60% plus, are, are buying because of a request from a client. So basically, they're a photographer, uh, they, they get a new uh, client uh, that is doing it, it, holding an event. Uh, the client says to them, you got the job, just send me your certificate of insurance. They either go on Google or call your broker, and we're in both of those places. Uh, and then basically uh, we get them set up with a policy. 
Uh, it could just be for the event or, or it could be uh, you know, on a longer term uh, basis. Um, they pay a little bit more for the flexibility and the on-demand nature of the policy, but, um, you know, but, but ultimately because it's a third party liability policy, it's not protecting uh, you know, first party losses, uh, there isn't really as much of an issue is with yeah. uh, uh, you know, moral hazard. Yeah, I get um, the, <laughs> the light bulb sort of went off in my head as you were describing that. Um, and then, like in those particular situations, why would they buy a year policy? Why would they buy something that's on 24 hours a day when they know, hey, I got this job. I don't even know when I'm going to get the next one after that. So why should I buy a year policy? So yeah, and, and, those, and there's probably quite a bit of that type of work going forward. That could also be the new normal too, right? In terms of how people engage the workforce, um, more on-demand work, more, more folks driving for Uber, more folks doing delivery, more folks um, having, um, instead of nine to five jobs, small pockets. You know, I got a small job on a weekend. You know, that, that could, that, the whole workforce could change too as well. I think it already is really changing. I mean, I think the nature of small business, uh, you know, the, the, the nature of the idea that I, I want to, uh, you know, start a small business, so I'm going to jump right to getting a Main Street shop, uh, and, and I'm going to work 40 hours a week in my shop and hire a couple of people and then go get business insurance. Those days, just to the extent that they ever really happened, uh, are, are pretty much over. You know, people will work their way in and out of these kind of businesses. You know, we have businesses that basically uh, that, that go up and down the spectrum all the time. Uh, you know, based on what's happening in their lives, what's happening in the business, they might have to take care of a family member, whatever it is. But this, this, there's been this blurring of personal and professional that I think is where Thimble really sits. It's, you know, your, your professional life, but on a personal basis, yeah. uh, taking into account you as a person as opposed to you as the, the shop that has, you know, five employees. Yeah. So uh, talk to me about pre-Thimble. Um, what were you doing? And connect the dots for us, how did you get to Thimble? Yeah, sure. So I, I started uh, two businesses before Thimble, but the last one was a ride sharing a ride sharing company in London called Halo, uh, that had investment from Richard Branson and was sold to Daimler uh, a couple years ago. Um, and, and one of the things that I noticed, this was you know in 2011 that the term the gig economy didn't really exist, uh, but the idea that people were starting to take work from apps and different sources and working in different ways was really starting to happen with, with the mass proliferation of, of mobile um, and other factors. Um, and so I just thought it was really interesting that this change was underway, but all of the core business services that you needed to actually start and grow a business were unadapted, right? And insurance was perhaps the most unadapted of any uh, you know, type of, um, uh, you know, type of service, huge market, massive percentage, uh, you know, of business uh, revenues go into it. But the idea was, look, whether you were a, a one person business or a fortune 500 company, you get the same one year pay in advance type policy, uh, just doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense in the modern world. Uh, and so uh, I teamed up with uh, Eugene, who I've known for about 10 years, was a consultant uh, to Halo uh, back in the day, but it started a business called Quidzy, uh, which was an e-commerce and logistics business that owned diapers.com and soap.com that was sold to Amazon in 2011. Uh, and we got together to do this. And, uh, you know, we've been really enjoying the challenge of actually really reimagining the insurance product um, and building new admitted products that people really love. Yeah. Uh, so talk about the entry into insurance. How did you what sort of partnerships did you need to form to sort of get this going? And you brought up admitted. So that's the added challenge of dealing with regulators. What was their reaction yeah. to the products? Well, so the, the, I think the last part first, the, the, the regulators have always been uh, tough, but fair, but, but certainly I think very welcoming to new technologies that favor, that can, can increase the amount of insurance in the market. So we have, we have always found that regulators were looking for ways to help us get this approved rather than the other way around. Um, and, you know, so, and, and I think they're even more, that's even more true today. I mean, basically, I think in most states, uh, regulators are even more interested in products that, that can address pain in the small business market today because of how much pain there is in the small business market, because of how, yeah. how, how much havoc the shutdowns have, have wreaked. People want new solutions. 
Um, but w w our first, uh, our very first uh, product uh, that we came out with was a general liability product. Um, uh, anywhere from an hour to a year as admitted product. Uh, and we, we worked with Markel uh, as uh, the, the underwriter of that product. Uh, so we, um, uh, we developed the filing, uh, we licensed them the filing, uh, they filed it on, on one of their papers. Uh, we've had a great partnership with them, very deep partnership with them. Uh, they are, a, I think, a brilliant, sophisticated uh, company that shares a lot of our values. Um, and so we, we've come to really appreciate and deepen that relationship over time. Uh, into other products, um, and yeah, so so it, the the process of getting these products out there is, as you know, or as you may have heard, is really really challenging. I mean, compared to almost any product other product category out there, admitted insurance products are tough. Every comma, every word has to be precisely right in the way that it's sold in the product itself, uh, in the policy, uh, in all yeah. of these things. Fifty different, fifty one different. Uh, you know, uh, jurisdictions to take into account. Uh, it, it is a really, really uh, challenging area to innovate. Uh, but the payoff is that the customers really appreciate it when they get something different. Um, and they really appreciate it. The fact that 99 out of 100 products are exactly the same, can't really differentiate in, in, except based on price. Uh, but there is this one that's really special. Yeah. So the, the product itself is very new. The concept is very new going hour by hour or day by day, for instance. And, um, you know, it, as you mentioned, admitted is really hard too. Um, have you run into any hurdles where it's just like, oh shoot, we, we, we're not pricing this correctly. We need to make a change and, um, you know, or did you come out of the gates kind of sort of with the with the right set of rates anyways and you didn't have to do that i'm i'm one because i'm trying for the audience like i'm trying to you know the admitted part is so difficult and a lot of it myself included have gone ens very concerned about the admitted part so the the cons how consistently are you having to go in and refile yeah. because you've caught like oh our rates just just aren't up to par we're gonna have to change them so, so, so look, I mean, I, I think our experience has been uh, that, you know, people are happy to pay a little bit more for our product. It's a premium product. Um, and, you know, it's the difference in a lot of cases between paying a $5 minimum, uh, which is our minimum, and a $300 minimum yeah. for a year that they didn't need in the first place, um, in many cases, or a year that they, they didn't really know that they needed. So they just really wanted to buy a month at a time, but nobody would let them do, it, do that. And we now... Uh, you know, do let them do that. I think we've listened to the customers over time. So we've gone from being able to buy just a, um, uh, anywhere between an hour and a year to being able to buy month, one month at a time. Thimble Monthly is, is the product that we call it. It's now pausable. Um, and, you know, like we view that as an evolution that allows us to service now the entire spectrum of people that want continuous protection, but don't know what's happening next, which is pretty much every business in America. Yeah. Um, or people who, as you noted before in your example, they, they want more of an event-based product, uh, at least for, for now. But over time, actually, a lot of them do graduate to, uh, you know, the, the Thimble Monthly product and start buying month to month. And then some of them may go back to the, the, the hourly product. Um, it's, it's really fine. We, we cater to the entire spectrum uh, and business life cycle. Um, and that's what we view as, as really special about the product set. Yeah. From a successful entrepreneur that's come into insurance from outside of it, um, there are any aspects of it that you're just like, that this really needs to change? So look, I think that a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the incumbent providers will use the regulatory um, uh, complexities almost as an excuse not to do anything differently. So basically the, the attitude will be, well, the reason we don't do all this is because it would be a huge regulatory challenge to, to do it. And yes, it would be a regulatory challenge, but it's not really the regulatory challenge that's the biggest challenge. It's the changing mentality. This is a very calcified, you know, barnacle encrusted type industry. Um, and there are very few companies out there that we have found that are really, really interested in breaking the mold, even if that means maybe cannibalizing some of their existing, uh, you know, business to do it. Um, we've been very happy to work with, with those companies, but, you know, we, we've been, you know, um, you know, we have seen basically the gamut of people say this was impossible from a regulatory perspective, et cetera. And until you actually do it, 
you can't really prove uh, that, that you were right. Yeah. So uh, what else is ripe for disruption here? Where, where could your model, uh, you, you know, globalize into? Well, you know, look, I, I think one of the things that is starting to happen, which we always knew was going to happen to us, was a lot of our, our smaller businesses are actually being successful and growing up, um, you know, and they're, they're hiring people, et cetera. So we've been trying to keep up with how do we adapt the product so that it can scale up with people who need professional liability, people who need in the marine coverage, um, you know, people that need care, custody and control because they're, um, uh, you know, in, a, in an industry like pressure washing or whatever it is that, that should have that. So we are, we have been trying to grow out the product uh, uh, portfolio smartly, but also grow the number of professions. So, you know, we are, uh, we are constantly expanding the number of professions. We have about 120 right now. Uh, I think next year uh, you'll see us with, with many, many more. Uh, the scale and scope of small business, I, I think is just incredible. And also, I think the the fact that basically the personal and the professional are really starting to merge. I mean, I'm working out of my house. You're working out of your house. It used to be a fringe thing, but now it's everybody's doing. Well, what are the implications for my homeowner's insurance versus my small business insurance versus everything else? It, it, it's these a lot of these questions have not been answered yet. We, we certainly want to position ourselves to be helping customers, uh, you know, as these this new world evolves. Yeah. Uh, one of the challenges of working with small businesses, um, I, I remember speaking to someone who worked specifically with tech startups um, in, in providing insurance for them. And this was a conversation I had with him on that was, um, you know, you get to a particular size and then all of a sudden you have, the, you know, the, the big brokers will want to come in. It's like, you know, with, with their resources to be able to throw that. Um, have you thought about or any concern about, you know, accounts leaving because they get to a particular size and, you know, they'll, you'll have uh, larger resource companies that will throw benefits at them? Well, I, I mean, we haven't really found that yet. I mean, we, we're, we're so far on the, the low end of the spectrum uh, that, you know, it's it, that time. what we have found actually is we have thousands of brokers that we work with as partners. Uh, and, and we have actually now not only brokers, but we also have, uh, you know, aggregators like Appalachian Underwriters and Iroquois, et cetera, uh, that we're working as well nationwide. Uh, and basically the idea is that those brokers get requests from time to time for small businesses. And it's just a lot of work. I mean, they got to uh, you know, they got to fill out the applications. They got to take all the information about the business. They, they got to get quotes, bring them back for $300, you know, minimum premium business to make a small commission on. So what we found is that they really like the, the fact that they can, uh, you know, get set up on our platform instantaneously, send uh, a link to the broker or bind the business themselves uh, and basically get customers set up in an instant on a better platform that's mostly self-service where they don't have to do anything, but they're stay, still able to earn industry leading commissions. Yeah. Um, so, so we think that, you know, that brokers will be partners and, you know, on the, on the off chance, we do have bigger businesses that, that come our way. We, you know, we can give them to our broker partners. Um, so I, I think there is a symbiotic relationship there. there. Yeah. Uh, you brought up distribution with the brokers. Um, any, any D to C opportunities? Uh, yes. So, so with, with, well, so we do, we have a, a full direct consumer, um, you know, outfit. We have an app where we're the only app on the app store that allows you to buy business insurance. We're being featured by Apple in the finance apps we love. Okay. Uh, it's very, very popular. Over half of the customers are uh, download and use the app to manage their policies. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, we are, a, we, we are a multi-channel, omni-channel uh, uh, organization. Uh, and we want to be where the customers are. So as we said, back to that example of, you know, uh, the, uh, the photographer that, um, uh, you know, that, that basically gets the customer that wants insurance, they're either going to go on Google or call their, uh, their broker. Uh, those are the two places that basically we want to make sure that we're there uh, when they do that. And we're, we're the easiest, quickest, and most flexible way for them to get the insurance that they need um, and then get that job. Yeah, I think uh, part of the challenge that a lot of folks that are listening to this may not recognize with that is that uh, that's a that's a uh, that's a tech challenge for you keeping track of all of that because you have your D2C and your your broker business and uh, keeping track of all of that 
uh, it's a lot of transaction. It's really complex. So you add the the regulatory environment as well, where you have a lot of eyeballs watching to make sure you're doing it right, right? I think a lot of folks that look to come in um, almost think of that as like, well, that's the easy part. And that might actually be the most challenging part is, is managing that pipeline all the way through uh, to get the policy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, we wrote our, our policy administration system from scratch because nobody could support uh, the, the type of flexibility that, uh, you know, that, that, that we have. Uh, and so we, we've always been uh, of the view that, that having our own tech stack uh, that is scalable, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and basically uh, and flexible and our, our own basically can allow us to do things uh, that a lot of a lot of the other companies find, uh, you know, find difficult uh, because we've been native of it. And we've always had an app from pretty much day one. Uh, this is just the only world that we know. But we understand that a lot of companies, uh, you know, that are using off the shelf systems. Uh, just uh, are, are have immense challenges to do things that we do very easily. Yeah, hey, could you could you describe how you uh, how much time was spent um, on on the different aspects uh, for that? Because I, again, I think it's it's understated like how complex that part of it is. Uh, did you well, instead of going into specifics there? Did you find that you were spending more time on the actual under building the underwriting part or the the wrapper around it to actually manage the business? Yeah, it's hard to separate them in our case, um, but you know the, the the policy management and underwriting, all of these kind of functions are uh, you know extremely complicated. They're now multi-product. They're everything specific to a state. There are revisions that happen in states. So we're talking about years of development yeah. with dozens of developers and tens of millions of dollars that have been spent on this. But we believe it's the best system currently in operation for not only the shorter term, but also uh, for the longer term policies, because we have the, uh, the capability to, to basically to sell and to allow people to manage their policies uh, via an app, which in business insurance, there just is nobody else that even yeah. has, let alone uh, is a competitor. Yeah, that's uh, that's marvelous. I, I think the lessons learned here are, you know, coming away, it's, um, as, as tech solutions come in, folks that are listening to this, it takes years, right? Like this is as much as this barnacle, uh, what'd you call it? Barnacle? Barnacle encrusted. Barnacle encrusted. That is so good because it's so true. As much as that's true, scraping the barnacles off and starting from scratch, it's a lot of hard work. And yeah, the opportunities are really big. And I, uh, I salute you for spending, you know, for, having uh, the wherewithal and the patience to kind of sit through it because I see a lot of folks coming in and they're, uh, they're, they want to move. Everybody wants to move quickly, but there's, there are gatekeepers. And part of that is um, if you want, if you want to have control over your tech, you might have to build it yourself and it could take years to do it. Yeah, this is a, it is a very, very challenging, uh, you know, industry and small business in particular, Right, is it, it, is really it's it's like selling to thousands of different uh, customers types rather than selling to one unified whole like it might be in car insurance or or yeah. uh, or, or uh, you know homeowners insurance. It, it is a really highly idiosyncratic. It's very challenging, but it's also very rewarding. And you know we think that right now we are going to see one of the most interesting times for the small business insurance market ever because in effect, seventy five percent of the businesses in the country. Are going to be startups again. You know, you, you have Bain talking about the new uh, skill for for CEOs is you know, not how to restart businesses, but how to start businesses because they got to look at everything from the ground up. You know, what, what is their what are their costs? What what's their insurance, etc. Nobody's ever seen this kind of event where everybody starts to look. Insurance gets back on the menu for every small business in America at the same time. So we are very interested to see what happens over the next year as a uh, you know uh, as a small but growing a player in the market. Uh, every business is going to be a, a startup or a small business again. And that's the way they're going to have to think about it. The new normal. Hmm. Dave Bregman, I appreciate you taking time out of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, for those that are listening, stay safe. Don't forget to subscribe. If you want to connect to Jay, to Thimble, or see the transcript for this particular podcast, don't forget to go to the show notes. Jay, thanks again. 
Thank you so much, Nick. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country.